and you're listening to the Lars Larson Show. Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. It's a pleasure to be with you live on the Radio Northwest Network, and we will get back to your phone calls and your emails, but I have a great opportunity today. If you listen to the show, you know that I'm one of those crazy people who believes that money in politics is actually free speech, that uh, if you limit somebody's ability to spend money, whether it's the campaigner himself or his contributors, you are, in effect, limiting free speech. That That's effectively the decision of the Oregon Supreme Court from a few years ago. So when I saw that an initiative had been uh, turned in with 54,000 signatures last Friday, I wanted to talk to Jason Kafori, who is the chief petitioner for that petition, which seeks to limit the amount of money that can be used in elections, at least in the City of Roses, the City of Portland. Jason, welcome to the studio. Thanks for having me, Lars. I appreciate you coming in. You're almost like an in-person naysayer for me. <laughs> Let's bring it on. So, per, per, you know, persuade me. I believe that money is free speech. You believe that we can put limits on it despite a Supreme Court decision at the state level that says you can't. So the Oregon Supreme Court is an outlier. Uh, there are 37 other states that have almost the exact same free speech language in their state constitution, and they have limits on political contributions, uh, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 to $2,000 range. Oregon is one of only five states in the entire country that have no limits on how much you can give a politician. So, for example, Phil Knight just wrote a check for half a million bucks to Newt Bueller to run for governor God here. God bless him. And, you know, to me, we think of ourselves this progressive place where, you know, uh, we, we have, you know, big-minded things happening. The truth is the Center for Public Integrity ranked how we finance our elections 49 out of 50 states. 49th, just barely ahead of Mississippi. So it's just not true. Big money runs the state. And I, and I think we both agree the Democratic Party runs the state, and that's why it hasn't changed. But see, I also think that even if you could put a limit on the direct expenditures by a campaign and contributions to a campaign, that the fact that you can't limit, it, limit independent contributions and independent expenditures. So if I got a wild hair and said, I really like this person, you know, in, in, in city elections, I, I tend to think it's either left or lefter. It's like you get a choice of candidates who are either like Elizabeth Warren or like, uh, you know, uh, Pocahontas, or like, like <laughs> you know, Pocahontas, like Elizabeth Warren, or like Bernie Sanders. It's left or lefter. There isn't much there. But if I ever got enthused and said, I want to go out and buy a couple of billboards for a couple of months for a few thousand dollars, you can't put a limit on me doing that, can you? Well, the one thing that this measure also does, which I think is really helpful, is I view money in politics like water trickling downhill. It's yeah. almost impossible to stop it completely. That's but, what I'm talking about, yeah. is, that, is that if you can't stop that, then what's the point of limits? But another piece I really like of this, uh, and California and Washington have this also uh, currently, is a disclosures. It's a taglines piece. And in that, uh, i give you a story. City of Richmond, uh, Chevron was very angry at, at the City of Richmond City Council because they were trying to ban an oil refinery there. Chevron decided to run an entire slate, uh, outspent all the sitting city council and mayor, 50 to 1. But it had to say paid for by Chevron Inc. as the major funder on every advertisement. Mm -hmm. And you know what happened? The Chevron slate lost. Every single person lost, even though they outspent them 50 to 1. So I believe in contribution limits, but to really identify the major donors as to who's giving the money, whether it's independent expenditures or uh, to candidates directly, I think a disclosures piece is a really good way for a healthy democracy to operate. It's interesting that you say that because there are times I think disclosures have been a good idea, and yet I've also heard liberals make arguments that are persuasive to me that especially in this political environment, the one we're seeing right now, where if you work for Donald Trump, you can't go anywhere in this country without being harassed, the grocery store, a restaurant, a movie theater, a public place. And the argument from progressives like yourself years ago was if you make people giving money, let's say, to a gay rights cause, have to disclose who they are, they will face some kind of public recriminations or public reprisals against them. And so there were liberals who made the argument simultaneously, make Chevron tell who they're giving money to, but let all these people stay secret or these organizations. So which one is it? Because you understand that even today, there are going to be causes, liberal causes, which if you have to disclose the donors, 
are going to literally perhaps even threaten those individual people or the individual organizations they're with. So you got to go with one or the other, don't you? Uh, well, the way I view it is, you know, first of all, this money in politics, limiting the contributions is popular left and right. If you look at the polling on this, this is something that both sides agree with. And I think that politicians are going to have to make decisions and they're going to have to decide, am I going to take a big check? And then I'm going to have to disclose who I'm taking the big check from. Mm -hmm. But the trick is, if you're going to have a good disclosures law, is the details. It's the devil in the details because you can create a group called Oregonians for Good Government, right? Well, who's the actual major funder? If it's Chevron uh, behind the scenes, you're not really doing anything by just saying Oregonians for Good Government unless you get to the major source of where that money originally Jason comes from. Jason Kafori's with me. And what you just described is precisely what George Soros just tried to do with the Washington County District Attorney's election. He poured a bunch of money in his name is not on any of it but it is through organizations and cutouts that allowed him to give that money so how do you get past I, that kind of thing I, I believe you have to open it up to all sides i think you have to open up to all sides if you're going to have a rule like that you got to play by the rules by both sides and frankly i think it evens the playing field to identify who the major funders are. We are a progressive place. I think, you know, the, the, the city here, as you, as you identify, is a very left city. This measure that we've just put on the ballot for the city of Portland, mm -hmm. it passed at the county level, Multnomah County level, 89.2% in 2016. That is unheard of to have a yes vote on something that's a re referral to the voters of that high percentage. It shows that people in this city want to have the big money out of the political system. All right, so since you're in the legal business, how do you answer the direct question that the Oregon Supreme Court has already decided this? While they may be unusual among other states in having the same language in the Constitution, but the Oregon Supreme Court said money is free speech. How do you get past that? You may get the voters to vote for this because it's popular. I think they're being misled into believing this will take the money out of politics. It'll just flow in a different way. I agree with your metaphor there. But when you do that and it goes to the courts and it will go to the courts, what's going to keep the courts from saying, no, the Supreme Court was right. That thing is unconstitutional. Well, you got to remember a couple facts. Number one, every single member of the Oregon Supreme Court now was not on that 1997 court that made that decision. So we have a whole new slate of people Stary addressing decisive. this. But the, U, the U.S. Supreme Court mm -hmm. has consistently upheld contribution limits. So the Oregon Supreme Court, that 97 decision, was going against both federal constitutional uh, uh, stare decisis, and it was going against the other 37 states. But I'd add this also, Lars. It's not just about whether it's constitutional or not. We'll let the Oregon Supreme Court decide that here in a few years. This has changed the culture of our local races. By passing this with such an overwhelming number, now we can go to politicians in the city and at the county level and say, hey, are you going to stand with the 89.2% of your constituents who want this? And we're starting to force candidates to take smaller checks. That's what I've noticed, at least in the county races. You know, I think, though, the other element to this, that's it, it's, it's not as strong an argument, but let me ask you about it anyway, and that is it becomes an incumbency protection. Now, I know that you might say to me, well, but if an incumbent is limited and the challenger is limited, then they're both similarly limited and it'll come right down to who has the best offer. The problem is that if you put limitations on people, Bernie Sanders is a good example in one case that he raised a ton of money sure. from individual people. And, and that showed his, but what happens if you have somebody running for city council who actually is a good challenger to replace a poor politician who's sitting there but this good challenger must be either funded by a mass of people, but cannot get, say, the contributions of 50 or 100 uh, people with the ability to write big checks. It might be that you'll keep that person from beating the incumbent and that this will be an incumbency, guaran not guaranteed, but it'll make incumbents more likely to be reelected. It's a great question, Lars. I think a healthy democracy requires two things, limits on contributions, and I think you need a public funding system. Oh, I, my I, God. I, I, no, I really believe no. in this, Lars. Let me tell you, Seattle just passed this, $100 to every voter. Okay, you get a thing in the mail, twenty five dollars each, and you can give it to whatever candidate you I like. I talk about it. You know, I, I and I like this. It's a drop in the bucket. You know, three million bucks is a drop in the bucket for a city's uh, you know overall budget. And to have a city where you have a limits on contributions, and you could go door to door and say, you know what, here's my iPad. You like my message? Go ahead and donate that free twenty five dollars that the city gave you. I think that would have the healthiest democracy we could have. But I will say this, Lars, it is a risk. To have a system where, yes, incumbents have, you know, there's only a small percentage of us here in the city that actually give money to politicians. So, and the incumbents do have the $500 checks that they could get. But 
I think that this will even the playing field because someone's going to feel more likely if they know that there's an even playing field that they can run for office and take on someone who's entrenched if they know that person can't go out and get a 10000 a 20000 a $30,000 check. You might be right. We'll if I to... were voting in Portland, I would vote against it, but I've already told you why. Jason, thanks a lot for coming in. Thanks. It was a pleasure, Lars. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Lars Larson Show.